the age of steam has finally gone. All that remains now is the memory, the metal carcasses, and a long wait for the breaker's torch. The steam engine is one of the most potent symbols of an era of both ruthless prosperity and bitter struggle, of a time when each machine had an individuality that a man could respect, come to terms with in a way that no longer exists. In 1923, Sir Nigel Gresley's new A3-class Pacific locomotive Flying Scotsman was a part of this tradition. Five years later, on the 1st of May 1928, it pulled out of King's Cross Station on the first non-stop run from London to Edinburgh. In 1934, it was the first steam locomotive to reach 100 miles an hour. And by then, the name Flying Scotsman had acquired a special glamour that has never really lost. After two million miles of service, Flying Scotsman made its last run for British Railways in 1963. It was bought the same year by businessman Alan Pegler. He restored it to its former LNER glory and has run it ever since on steam excursions for railway clubs and societies. My enthusiasm for railways doesn't... Pegler's railway enthusiasm has become a way of life. His dream of repeating the non-stop run exactly 40 years later on the 1st of May, 1968, is now a reality. To do it has cost him both time and money. I was lucky enough to have a family business to go into, or I thought I was lucky enough to at the time. And of course, having spent most of my younger life being prepared to run this business, which I did, eventually became chairman and managing director, the business uh, befell the fate that befalls so many others and got taken over. But the only good thing about that was that uh, it just so happened that the takeover occurred about a year after I'd bought the Flying Scotsman locomotive. So I had the decision to take whether to decide to go on working for somebody else or another company, or to opt out and do something entirely new. And I decided to opt out and do something entirely new, which meant that I'd got the time to devote to running all these curious activities which are terribly time consuming. One could not possibly, I think, do the sort of things that I've been doing in the last year or two, unless one was able to do that and nothing else. Of course, when one buys a piece of machinery like the Flying Scotsman and intends running it, especially non-stop to Scotland, one has to have somewhere to keep and maintain it. At the time, one had to look around with an eye to the future and one found that Doncaster was one of the few locomotive depots left that could cope with this kind of work. It was near the family business, and of course the Flying Scotsman itself was built here, so back here she came. One simply pays the rent and all the bills, and British Railways do the rest. I'm lucky enough to have the services of a number of retired railwomen who keep her looking the way she should look. And I'm pretty certain the reason they do this is not because of the present day glamour attached to the Flying Scotsman, but the fact that they're able to recapture a way of life that they possibly grumbled about as young men, but which nevertheless became a part of living that they felt they had lost forever. You came to work. Uh, you had a snap tin, you were packed up. You didn't know how long that snap was going to last you. I mean, you might be away as long as 16 hours on occasions. Many a time come home to a, a dried up dinner or a, a wife in a bad temper. I've seen my children at home, they said, hello, Dad, are you going to work? No, I'm not. Oh, you'll be going to bed then. And that's the kind of thing he used to get. It was either all work and no pleasure or all work or all bed. That's, that's how it used to be. There's none of that nowadays, I don't suppose.
It's rather a strange feeling, though, after... Well, I was working it out. It's about three and a half years, really, that this exercise first was mooted. And now that it's finally come to the morning, it's rather like, um, I suppose, a diver on the high board waiting to take the plunge. And uh, I really can't wait now to and get on the foot plate and get on with it. How much do you think we've got on there now? The nine ton, In the old days, of course, when there were plenty of steam locomotives running everywhere, uh, there was no problem. The water was treated in advance. Now, you never know what sort of water you're going to get. So we treat our own in this way. These briquettes will fill in here, and gradually during the journey, these get dissolved into the water, and it ensures that you get uh, nice clean water in the boiler, and uh, it makes the boiler last a great deal longer, at least that's the theory anyway. Half a minute, I'm going to test it. Half a minute. The object, as far as I was concerned, was to be allowed to have a go. And it is an extraordinary thought, I, in my opinion, anyway, that on a great nationalised undertaking, one can take out a private piece of machinery, 45 years old, and uh, hitch it onto a train of British Railways stock and take 300 people 400 miles on, the, on a weekday in the middle of all the other services. Uh, let's face it, I mean, this is a pretty sporting gesture on the part of the British Railways board, in my opinion, anyway. I'm not able to go on the run today. But I just wanted to come and see my dear old engine again to say, how do, and wish her good luck. Right away.
a long journey behind a steam locomotive. It's so nice for some people, for me certainly. And to other people it's perfectly horrible. Yes, uh, the smell, the familiar smell of smoke and the beat of the engine and the feeling that you're being pulled not by a mechanical box on wheels but by something pulsing and alive. It's an aesthetic experience. It's a good railway journey by a steam train. A good journey by an electric train is a nice experience. And uh, any journey by train, as so long as you can't smell diesel exhaust too much, but a good journey by steam, it's, it's a realized work of art. same engine, a very lighter load, but vitally important still. The railway services in this country have been cut back more and more, and to be able to show that a good old steam train can still do it, I think will make us very proud. Everybody on this train very proud. Spent 47 years on the railways, yes. and uh, it's a big change from my days to what it is today. And uh, I'll, that's what I've come for today because I think I'm approaching 80, and I think it'll be uh, last time I shall see a steam engine.
Now that's one of the typical sort of dodgy things that you can't legislate for. Apparently a broken rail being replaced and uh, nothing you can do about it. We go literally down to walking pace, but quite literally the wheels did just keep turning, so we can still honestly say we haven't stopped. But it's a damn sight too near for comfort. And quite naturally, the interest transferred itself to my son. And when he was ill, you know, with measles at the age of three, the mo it was most natural for me to tell him stories about trains. And is it Daddy? What was the engine? What are the engines' names? <laughs> And uh, I invented names on the spur of the moment, Edward, Gordon, Henry, and so on. There was Edward's Day Out, uh, Henry in the Tunnel, and then there was another story based on a story I'd read in the magazine about a Highland Railway banker being left behind. This was the story of how Gordon got stuck on the hill and had to be rescued by Edward, the engine whom he despised, banking him in the rear. But once Edward had started him off, Gordon was able to go on fast and poor Edward ran out of steam and got left behind. And so there it was. And the first book, Three Railway Engines, was published in 1945. You know, we, we too, Audrey, we, we rather remind me of two of your engine characters talking. And, uh, oh, yeah, for that matter, what about Bret Hart's uh, thing? Let's wind up with him. Uh, you know, that was what the engines said, unreported and unread, spoken slightly through the nose with a whistle of the clothes. Doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should be done in an American accent, though, which I didn't attempt. <laughs>
About three years ago I started collecting the numbers oh. simply then for something to do while I was watching the trains oh. but then I sort of got hooked on it and well when getting near to completing a class you want to carry on and try and complete it. Pay it up to? Yeah. Right, okay. Well, this is the highly dodgy situation that I hoped we were not going to find ourselves in, that we are now in. Uh, we've had two rather poor pickups of water, and only one good one out of three. And it's really a question now as to whether to take the water that we have got laid on in reserve at Berwick on Tweed, or whether to take a calculated risk, I suppose is the term, and carry on beyond the point of no return and try and make Edinburgh. Now, this sort of decision is not mine. I'm not a professional rail woman. I'm merely an enthusiast. And obviously, my inclination would be to press on and have a go. But the people who carry the can, if anything does go wrong on this, are really the chief motive power inspector and his number one. That's to say, Les Richards and George Harland, and they're having a conference up on the engine at the moment. And that's why I've come back into the train so that I don't in any way influence them. We shall know within a matter of minutes now whether we're going to do any more. myself and consider that with 3,000 gallons of water we have sufficient to take us to Edinburgh. where we could have got some emergency water was there at Berwick-on-Tweed and by being switched around the little goods loop we were right alongside a road tanker that had 4,000 gallons of water in it. I don't know how much we've got on board but my guess would be with the mileage we've got to do we've probably got about two and a half to 3,000 gallons. I don't know. You but I will, that will, be I will, when we get I will go in a minute and find out because I don't know. You looked very cool when, we, were, when we nearly came to a stop outside Berwick. You, you well, I think it must have been a very emotional it, moment. It's it absolutely fatal to do this sort of exercise if one's going to 
do one's nut every time anything goes wrong, because, I mean, one knows from experience, I have been lucky enough to be able to do this kind of run, not, not this drama, but this sort of run, many times over the last five years, and it's rather the um, uh, exception if things do go completely without a hitch. They do sometimes go completely without a hitch, but usually there's a difficult decision somewhere or other to be taken about something or other. You are aware, presumably, that there are 800, 1,800 pints of beer on board. Well, that would be a great help, of course, <laughs> a great comfort. <laughs> <laughs> that might be, that we might be very glad of that. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> and I think she'd probably run very well on my nail. <laughs> Steam going. Yes, it was something about a steam train that it had its own pers each engine had its own personality, you know, and you don't see that with the diesels. We sir regard railways both in the museum the historical sense and the modern sense. And while we regret the passing of the steam engine, nevertheless we consider that British railways by nineteen seventy will be the best in the world. The nation that forgets its past has no future. Let's leave it at that. To let my little boy see the Flying Scotsman. He's never seen a steam train. He's mad about trains. Does he know it's the Flying Scotsman? Yes, oh yes. What's the train called? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think uh, from time one is a little boy right on to manhood, uh, uh, a train and railway uh, has always got uh, uh, a fascination. And I think today to know that uh, after uh, 40 years, uh, we're still able to do this uh, journey of nearly 400 miles non-stop. I think it's still part of that fascination. to have got here non-stop. That was the main object of the exercise, to do it without stopping. And although we had just one or two very, very close scores, got down to walking speed once or twice, we did, in fact, achieve it without stopping at all. And uh, I think we got here just about 30 minutes inside the old 1928 timing. Admittedly, with a lighter load, but uh, anyway, it's pretty good, I think, with an engine now 45 years old. When she did it 40 years ago, she was a youngster, and now she's not as young as she was done well over two million miles and uh, I think to have done that run after all those years is really quite an achievement. Thank you. 